We are back, listeners, with yet another podcast here at the Women of Wrestling Podcast. I'm Stu Allen. I'm here with Lee Burton. Podcast four of six, ladies and gents. <laughs> That's the plan. That's the plan. Are you feeling the burn? I'm doing all right. You know, I'm feeling quite good about it. I just wanted to say hi to Gemma Palmer, our, uh, our former guest on this show, who apparently listens to every single one of the shows that we do. Why? Why are you doing this? Why not listen to something else? There must be something better out there. Shh. Don't say that. Uh, but no, um, it's nice to have a uh, celebrity listener. It's always good. Um, if you are a celebrity listener, let us know. www.hosts at gmail.com. Um, but Bill back- Gates, if you're listening, uh, give <laughs> us a yell. And some money. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, uh, we're, we're back with another show. Tonight we're going to be joined by Annie Social uh, of uh, WSU, Shimmer, Dangerous Woman of Wrestling, Naked Women's Wrestling League fame. You name it, she's been there. Um, she's going to be an interesting chat. I think she's uh, taken uh, not the not not the routine way into the business. Um, she's uh, she's ploughed her own furrow, and uh, yeah, she's going to be an interesting uh, chat. I think. Yeah, if you, if you consider the normal way of uh, getting into wrestling being a nice clean tarmac road, she's probably hacked her way through tropical tundra to get to where she is. Yeah, but she's got there, and um, she's coming up later on. I know, as I say, we're running through these podcasts pretty quickly, so if you haven't had a chance to check out some of the stuff we've done recently, you mentioned Gemma Palmer. She was one of our recent guests. Jetta was on recently as well. And the most recent one we've done before this one was Amazing Kong. Um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to any of those three, please go back, check the archives on DVD or on iTunes. Download them, check them out. Particularly pleased with all of them. Um, I think we've been doing uh, a good job at bringing you uh, interviews that you wouldn't necessarily hear, and uh, we continue to try and do that if we can. The one one thing though that, considering that we're doing this show fairly regularly at the minute, that we can actually talk about, and that is um, what's going on in the world of wrestling. We can actually be topical for once. God forbid. <laughs> yeah, because usually it was um, you know weeks apart between shows, but uh, but we can actually talk about it. One of, one of the things we talked about last week was the fact that um, that Layla was the new women's champion on... Uh, oh, or on so Saturday. we thought. Or so we thought. Well, she is the champion of record. That's um, according to WWE.com, but they got an interesting little gimmick going on now where she and uh, Michelle McCool are co-champs. Part of me really likes that, and part of it really winds me up. I, I don't know. I like it. Um, I, I, it. Yeah, it would be nice if Layla got the, the, the spotlight to herself as the champion, but I think it's only going to come eventually. I think at some point the ego is going to get in the way of Michelle McCool. But at the minute, I, I, I dig Lay cool, and I, I, like, I like the fact that she wears a T-shirt that says, you know, was it Woman's Champion BFF or something like that. I, I quite like that. I am loving Layla's work as well. Yeah. It's not just a case that she's a good character anymore. It's also a fact that she is so unbelievably smooth in that ring. Yeah. Um, I mean, as, a, as, as somebody who's got a big dance background, and you know, she's fantastic at that, she's picking up the movements quite well. Yeah, it's, it's not, I, I guess it's one of those cases where she doesn't necessarily know like the whole basis around the moves, but if you showed her how to do it, she'd be able to replicate it very quickly. Yes, and and that's the, the, a good first step, um, you know. And she, she's uh, she's done really well for herself considering she came in as a, a diva search winner, and you know, being being the first, I think the first diva search winner to win the women's title, isn't that right? She is, yes. Yeah. So, uh, congratulations to that. But we'll see how the things pan out as far as she and Michelle McCool are concerned. Um, their opponents, the only real other part of the SmackDown division, were. Um, well, Kelly Kelly and Tiffany, they had a match this past week on SmackDown. Um, and Kelly Kelly's also one of our interviews in the archive. Check that one out. Fair point. Well made. Um, but we'll see, how, we'll see how that plays out. Um, you haven't seen the tag match that they had on SmackDown. I haven't seen SmackDown yet, no. But I have. Go on then. Now, it wasn't the best match in the world. It wasn't the longest match in the world. You wouldn't call it two stars. But the thing about it was, it was for what it was, tremendously exciting. A lot of these women's matches just don't really have any kind of excitement to them. But some of the spots that they were executing were just so nicely done and rapid as well. There was no blown spots. There was no hesitations. There was no fumbling around try, trying to wonder what to do next. It just flowed really nicely. I really enjoyed it. Mm. Good. I'll look forward to seeing that. Um, one thing I did see, though, was Impact. Um, well, I say I watched Impact. I saw the uh, the match in question that we're going to talk about now, and that was Madison Rain and Roxy. 
the return of Roxy, um, a.k.a. Nikki Rocks, to some of our listeners, came out of nowhere. And uh, after all the good work they did with Madison Rain by actually letting her beat uh, Tara clean and raise her profile, they had her immediately lose on the next show to uh, to Roxy. I assume this will set up a title challenge, and hopefully Madison wins that one. So, I mean, I can't really... I can't really criticise too much, but it was certainly nice to see Roxy back, and she looked a million dollars. It was good to see Roxy back, and yes, she did look fantastic, and she got she got a nice pop from the crowd as well. But I do have a bit of a problem with the fact that she went over Madison Rain to start off this program because yeah. you've got you've got a decent handful of women who you could put um could put Roxy over. You could have had a go over ODB if ODB's in the doghouse, like we heard about. Yeah, oh. you could have sent the message out there, put her in the doghouse straight away. Yeah. That would yeah, and and have that established and you know just do the classic you know, move your hands around your waist I want the belt sign that everybody knows and understands and then Roxy's got to fight her way through the beautiful people to get the Madison exactly then you've not jobbed out your champion like the week after you'd given her her most important win to date it kind of negates all that and nullifies it yes yes it does especially the way it happened as well just because the fight it was so quick it was like the, you know the match was going on and then it was all of a sudden. Roxy thought, okay, I'm going to finish this now. And she just yeah, I'm bored of you now. She, yeah, she just picked her up into the Barbie Crusher, drilled her, and finished her. Um, Food or, drop. Beg your pardon. Um, but yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I assume uh, and expect that this will set up uh, Madison and Roxy at the at the pay per view, but we'll see. Um, it's also I have worth- no doubt that it'll be a decent match, by the way. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. Um, I'd also like to mention as well, it's just uh, talking about the impact uh, tapings that the. Tip basically, what, a month's worth of TV this past week. We saw the debut of the person we were talking about on the Kong podcast, um, and that was, well, we called her Betsy Ruth on that podcast. That's one of her that's one of her gimmicks. She's actually using another of her gimmicks, uh, and that's Rosie Lotta Love. Now, I didn't get the reference. You did. I did. I, well, I mean, it's, it's clearly a reference, at least as far as the name's concerned, to the ACDC song, Whole Lotta Rosie. Um, and I think there's also a bit of Whole Lotta Love in there as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that was where the, 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 the influence of the name came from. It does sound a little bit like someone who should have been in an Austin Powers movie. I think you're probably right. I, I, <laughs> I, I know from a few people who have spoken to that as far as the gimmick goes, it's a nice gimmick and it's fun and it's happy and it's sweet and it's nice, which obviously means that it's definitely not a con clone. But, and I say but because I, I, I feel bad for saying it because I know it's her gimmick and everything, but I don't know if it's the kind of gimmick you'd want to put on an international level to try and make a name for yourself. Yeah, that may not be the case. Um, although I'll, I'll give it the, at the moment until I actually see how it plays. I, I'll give the idea in concept at the minute of of her feuding with the beautiful people and saying that you know you don't have to be um, you know blonde haired, big breasts and big teeth to be beautiful. You can be beautiful in other ways. I, as a gimmick, that's fine. I like the I like the concept of the feud. Um, we'll see how it plays out, of course. I'll tell you the big, the other big problem I have with it. You mentioned about the fact that yes, she, that there is the likelihood or the possibility that she might fight through the beautiful people and prove that you know you, you don't have to be you know a, a sort of cookie cutter woman to be considered attractive, and that's all fair enough. However, this is the same promotion that has Orlando Jordan playing a very very big homophobic button pushing game. Yes, exactly. It, it, it doesn't tend to do these things very well, and it has a track record for it. I just, I'm just imagining a whole bunch of really tasteless and unfunny fat jokes. Yeah, we saw enough of that earlier this year with uh, the Piggy James stuff, and of course last year as well with the Vicky Guerrero stuff as well. And I don't want to see that again. No. It's like you, you say you, she's making the point out that you know you don't have to be a certain size and shape to be beautiful, and then you get three people coming out and saying, "Well, yeah, you do." And which one of them are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to the ones who've been have been established and have a track record and and have success behind their backs. So you're going to listen to the newbie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a fair point, but as I say, I've, I'm giving it a cautious welcome as far as an idea is concerned. We'll see how it plays out. Um, oh, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of um, speaking of Mickey James, by the way, um, her new album has been released. Um, I haven't heard much of it. I did. I, I bought it on iTunes. Um, I listened to. It. I'm not a big country fan. My 
my my my country uh, radar is basically Johnny Cash and the Wreckers. I think um, I pretty much finish Achy Breaky Heart and this <laughs> is by Faith Hill. Yeah, um, and it's, this is certainly far more uh, towards the Wreckers end of things than Johnny Cash. But no, I mean I I quite liked it. I must admit I've listened to the album a few times and it's good. I, it's it's different to what I usually listen to. But I have liked it. There's no doubt, obviously, that the reason I gave it a chance in the first place is because it was Mickey James and because yeah. I'm a fan of hers. Um, I wouldn't have bought a random girl's country album if it wasn't for the fact it was Mickey James. But I don't regret buying it, and that's all I can really ask for. I've enjoyed it. It's had replay value in my house. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I can't say that I've listened to all of the album like you have, but I did listen to that first single that she brought out, and I quite liked it. I mean, I didn't think it was anything special, but it wasn't offensive to me. And it kind of reminded me of the kind of song you would drive along to at speed. Uh, it, was that, it was that kind of one that just sort of gets your blood pumping a little bit. And that's quite good for a first single. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it was a bit of a call to arms as well. Um, Are you with me? And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Good driving track and uh, more power to you. Thumbs up, Mickey. Why not? Um, before we move on, I've got a couple of couple of med- things we want to mention. Uh, the next set of Shimmer tapings have been announced. Yes, they have. Yes, it's going to be on the 11th and 12th of September. Um, and it's going to be in Berwyn at the Eagles Club, the uh, the usual venue. Uh, hopefully we're going to be there. That's the plan at the minute. I'm certainly planning to be there, but at the minute I've got, uh, I've got work issues, but... Uh, Quit your job. Assuming assuming we can work around those... Uh, Quit know, your we, job. <laughs> shut up. Assuming <laughs> we can work our way around those, um, we will try and be there uh, for that. Uh, and I would urge anybody that's heard us or Stephen and David or anybody else talking about Shimmer to consider making a uh, pilgrimage over to Berwyn on those dates. Well, Tickets go on sale for the front row, I think, 6th of June. Let's put it this way. If we can make it over there for a fifth time... You can make it over there if you live in the States. Exactly. Quite if you're listening from elsewhere, it probably is a bit of an issue. Yeah, but if, you, if, you, if you're listening from the continental United States of America, first of all, congratulations. And second of all, there's no excuse. Um, yeah. But no, so hopefully we'll see you there, and um, it's, uh, it, it's going to be happening. If you're listening to this in Turkey, because I've noticed that we have quite a few Turkish listeners based on our uh, uh, Women of Wrestling podcast Facebook page. Uh, if you're listening to it in Turkey, uh, come along, because quite frankly, we like to see that. There was a Dutch guy there last time, flew out by himself. Really? Yeah. Wow, okay. The uh, the European contingent is growing. Hey, it's one of those things you got to do. I never thought I'd be back for uh, the fifth time, but <laughs> it's, it's funny that promotion... Really? That promotion's got a way of getting in your uh, in your brain somehow. And it's not just the show itself; it's also the after party. Well, we've talked about that, but uh, as, as we said before, you know, it's best not to talk about the after party. It's best just to go and experience the after exactly. party. Exactly. Oh, that was all I was going to say about it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's move on at this point. Then we've um, we've got our interview coming up with Annie, so we hope that we'll be back after this one. Uh, maybe in another week's time or so, hoping to get uh, Lufisto on for that one. So, fingers crossed, the show after this should be Lufisto. Um, but until then, please enjoy some time in the company of Annie Social. Uh, we are back with the uh, WSU Shimmer and Soon to Be Pay Per View Superstar Annie Social. Annie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, no problem at all. Um, I say future pay per view superstar because. Uh, a big thing coming up uh, this coming week on Thursday, May 27th, 2010. Dangerous Women of Wrestling are running at the uh, arena, former ECW arena, with something they're recording for pay-per-view. And uh, and you seem to be the big star. Well, I mean, like, I'm pretty excited about it because uh, I think this is their first live event in, I, I want to say, like, maybe six years. And they were the first company I ever worked for, so it's pretty cool. It's kind of like a big homecoming and whatnot, and I haven't had a show in Philly in at least, like, three years, maybe more. Really? And I live here, so it's, like, weird. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it is, I mean, I think maybe way back in the day I had a Dangerous Women of Wrestling VHS, but I, it's, not, it's not a promotion <laughs> I know a lot about, but the thing that, that really interested me on the, on the poster or on the advert, it says, 
featuring hot women, wrestlers, midgets, cripples, dancers, and more. Cripples, you say? Yeah. Explain this to me. It's kind of like uh, Jerry Springer had a wrestling promotion. It's pretty much anybody will show up any given time and anything can happen. I'm really keen on watching this, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> It's going to be fun. That's well, I guess, I guess as far as um, if we're sticking with uh, with Dangerous Women in Wrestling, you mentioned that it's, it's where you got your start. I mean, you we, we talk we talked about how you know you have you've uh, probably not had the most sort of direct route as, as far as a wrestler is. Uh, you, yours has been quite quite a sort of winding road. Uh, how, how you got started and uh, you know, how you ended up uh, getting involved in wrestling? Um, well, I mean, honestly, it kind of happened on accident. Like, it's not like, I'm not like everybody else. It's like, oh, I've been watching wrestling since I was three years old, and it's always what I wanted to do, because, like, I really didn't care about wrestling at all, like, to be honest. I was, I grew up in, like, a boxing house, and my dad was a huge boxing fan, so I was totally into that, and I actually used to box for a little while, and I took, like, martial arts and stuff when I was a kid, but I never, like, I never saw, like, WWE and said, ooh, I want to do that. But um, I was working at a bar in uh, Center City, in Philadelphia, and a promoter for uh, Dangerous Women Wrestling and WEW came in, and they were actually coming to see a girl that I worked with because uh, she was like an oil wrestler, like they used to do oil wrestling at uh, intermission, and uh, you know they asked me if I wanted to do it, and I was like, I had to be like 19 years old at the time, so I was like, yeah, cool, man, I'll do it, whatever, I'll try it out. So I went to the show, and I had an oil match with uh, G.I. Ho. And that was actually my first, like, time in a wrestling ring ever. Not that it was, like, pro wrestling, but, yeah. So I did that, and they actually, they kept booking me for shows. So I did that for a while, probably a couple years. And I met, his uh, his wrestling name was Davey May. He was, like, the short, like, one of the, like, farmer family dudes or whatever. And, and he was friends with uh, Trent Acid and Johnny Cashmere, and they were opening a school. And I started training with them and then just started networking and working for different promotions through them. And that's kind of how it happened. And how did that then transition from you uh, into professional wrestling? I mean, is it something that you started, you liked the, red, the pro wrestling or, or was it something that just, hey, it's another way to make some money? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I like I got bored with the oil wrestling, honestly. Like, it was, it was, like, three minutes of rolling around with some random chick and, like, whatever. just like, And it looked like more fun to do the pro wrestling part of it. And now it's what I do. So it's pretty cool. The training would have been, what, through PWU, is that right? Mm-hmm. How did you find it as somebody coming into wrestling then and coming into a school where they're training you to be a pro wrestler when you, you really had no idea of what was expected of you? Did, did you find the concepts of wrestling difficult, you know, working on a certain side and all that sort of thing? I, it was all kind of weird, you know what I mean? Like, because it was, it was not like anything I'd ever done before. Like, when you, when you train for boxing and stuff like that, you're, you're, not, you're not trained to fall down. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so weird. So, like, just basically the whole concept of just falling backwards and flipping myself to my doom was kind of odd to me. Well, as far as the boxing thing is concerned, it, it, and you, you trained, you were, did a bit of boxing when you were younger. Did that Was that more of a sort of help or a hindrance when you were then sort of learning how to wrestle? I think it was a help uh, because of the footwork drills and stuff that we used to do. Like, basically, it helped me not to trip over my own feet in the ring. I don't feel like, you know, kind of like a baby deer. You know, they walk kind of all weird. Like, like Bambi on the ice. Yeah, exactly. Were you training with anybody who we do, we know of now? Um, hmm. You guys uh, know Dan Moore? Yep. He was a uh, king of the deathmatch, I think, a couple years in a row. He's a really good friend of mine. I trained with him. Was it primarily men you were training with then? Yeah, mostly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mostly guys. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, Teddy Fine. He's a local, uh, local indie guy from Philly. Uh, I did some training with Mike Keener, ECW ref Mike Keener. Yep. Yeah, he's he's awesome. He taught me a lot. Well, I think the thing, the, the thing we were really keen to, to, or the reason why we were really keen to speak to you is just because we we, we watched you. We'll get to Shimmer Shimmer in, in a little bit, but we watched you at Shimmer, and I, I was sort of fascinated by the by the whole antisocial character. It's it's it just seems it seems like it. Quite quite edgy, but at the same time quite alluring, and it's I, I would equate it almost to the sort of the sort of girlfriend who a guy would have, but would be terrified to take her home to mum because <laughs> yeah, 
you'd be afraid what your mum might say, and you'd be terrified to introduce you to your dad, because your dad might fancy your girlfriend. So, you, you, I've got to ask about the antisocial character. Where did it come from? How did you sort of build it up? Honestly, like, it, it's kind of just me with the volume turned up. Because I'm, I'm naturally kind of like a mean chick to a point. So I just kind of, I kind of turned the volume up on that, and there it is. Like, I'm really not that much different in, and I don't really want to say real life, but... You know what I mean? I'm just kind of laid back, and I'll, I'll pretty much I'll fight anybody that wants a step. Like it's not it's not a problem. Sounds like you you quite a sort of tomboy at heart, by the sounds of it. Then uh, definitely, like as girly as I get is when I got to put the war paint on to go out to the ring and do whatever I got to do. Like I'm actually sitting here right now in my pajamas with my hair tied up, looking a hot mess. So and there's no for everybody out there on the Women of Wrestling podcast. That's our treat to you. <laughs> I suppose, you know, as far as um, any socialist concerned, I think uh, one of our one of our friends who was who was at the show would kind of describe you. I think uh, all the character as sort of alluring scum. I think was the way, to, the way yeah, that they yeah. said. Almost like so you, you sort of hate her, but you you really sort of also a- attracted to the character at the same time. <laughs> See, you know, it's funny. Um, like I, I'm not I'm not really a big reader of mess boards. But, you know, I decided to peruse a little bit the one day, and one of the funniest things I ever read from a fan was, uh, he said, uh, (laughs) I was really looking forward to meeting Annie Social, and as soon as she opened her mouth, she sounded like Devin Moore. (laughs) (laughs) Is is that that a compliment, or I'm I'm not sure? (laughs) Well, I mean, I have, like, a gritty voice, you know what I mean? Like, I don't really sound like like a Tinkerbell chick, so I just, I thought that was kind of funny. But what are you going to do? I think you know the the voice really does sort of. I mean, I know it's not something which you which, which you try to perfect or anything like that. It's just who you are. But uh, it, it does sound. It does sort of add to add to the character as well because you know the character is you know, gritty and edgy and, and quite aggressive. And it's almost like your your voice sort of lends to that. Hey yeah, man, at least, at least it makes sense in some point. <laughs> you know what I mean. And the other thing I've got to ask as well, where you're built from? Ah uh, yes, North Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> Now I've got to ask because a friend of mine's moving possibly to Philadelphia at some point. Is it is it sort of like you know like like a murder capital or something like that? Or is it is it just a case you, again you're turning the volume up on where you live? No, well actually I recently moved back to my old neighborhood, and uh, you know I live at Kensington, which is basically North Philly. But I mean you know the neighborhood you're fine. If you got some people, but um it's notoriously a pretty bad spot. Like for instance I have a uh, about four blocks from my house, there's a Dunkin' Donuts, which is like our big chain coffee shop around yeah. there. And uh, the doors aren't open ever. Like, they have the doors locked. You have to walk through the drive through Car what? or no car. Yeah. You got to walk through the drive through to get the coffee. Like, I thought it was hilarious. I'm like, wow, serious? Like, why are they not open at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? So, like, I'm trying the door, and there's this crazy homeless lady, and she's like, nah, nah, you got to try to win it. So I had to walk around the side, and it was it was kind of strange. I'm standing in the middle of the driveway behind the car. Well, that's weird. I know traditionally they don't like you doing that. So I remember reading something a couple of days ago about a guy who got who wasn't being served but he walked through a drive-through. Yeah, they they typically. They won't, they won't serve you to go off their drive-through, but like that's the only way you can get coffee now. This place been robbed a few times, then. That's what I'm guessing. <laughs> I know, right? It's awesome. You know what, though? Everything's right here, so, like, I don't care. I'm walking distance from anything I need. As far as that's concerned, do you feel like, because I've lived in a, a couple of rough areas in my time, and is it a case of, you know, you just feel sort of comfortable, and even though you know it's kind of a rough area, you feel kind of, you feel okay in it because you kind of know where the where the iffy places are, let's call them that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I know this neighborhood like the back of my hand, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I totally feel comfortable. I actually, I was living in a better part of the city about... A month ago, and I felt uncomfortable there. Like, I just kind of felt like I was out of my element, but, like, now that I moved back, like, I really feel like I'm home, you know? So you are gritty at heart, then? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Okay, well, taking it back to the wrestling, then, um, after, what, PWU and uh, Dangerous Women of Wrestling, what was your next step as far as uh, your pro career was concerned? I was trying to get booked, like, anywhere that I could get booked because I just, I, I really liked it. I liked, you know, working for the crowd and stuff like that. So I was trying to get a booking wherever I could get it, basically. So I guess uh, from uh, Pro Wrestling Unplugged, 
uh, after I was working with them, I started with WSU and then back to Jersey All Pro. And in the interim, I got some bookings with NWE in, uh, in Europe. So that was pretty cool. Like I've been in a couple, uh, rad little, uh, countries mm-hmm. with them. Well, we N- did, uh, NWE was something that we, that we wanted to ask you about as well, because I, I, I think one of the things that we most know you for in, N- in NWE is that you had a triple threat series with uh, Al Barrio and Sarah Jones and also Lizzie Valentine as well, in, in you know, quite big arenas with, with, with plenty of people there. As, as far as a, a setting goes, is that one of the sort of biggest places that you'd worked in? Uh, definitely, by far the biggest. So how, how, many, how many people were there? I think, were they, uh, it was tens of thousands, wasn't it? Um, at one point, I think in Spain we had about 5,000. Oh, And uh, when they did, I actually wasn't on the show in Madrid, but I'm pretty sure in Madrid they had about 15,000. Were you on the show where the Ultimate Warrior came back, just out of curiosity? Um, he was there um, while I was there, but he wasn't on the same shows I was on. Like, I had actually left uh, before they did, I think it was Barcelona. Oh, okay. It was either Boston or Madrid. He did the show, but I did get to meet him. What was that like? Uh, he was a nice guy. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting character. Nice yeah. guy, though, nonetheless. I, I figured Yeah, he was. Yeah. I, I think um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that people might know you for as well is, um, is NWWL, the uh, Naked Women's Wrestling League. Just because the fact that it was, it was as far as infamy is concerned, not necessarily that it was it, it was necessarily a bad thing or anything like that, but I think it's where people might may have uh, may have found out who you were. Yeah. What was that like? Um, you know what? It was actually pretty cool. Um, they had a good group. Uh, believe it or not, Ron Hutchison was the main trainer for them. So they yeah. had like a, a, an awesome trainer working with their girls. Uh, it was a really good crew of people. Uh, they didn't, they went totally out of their way to make sure that you felt a hundred percent comfortable with everything. You well, know what I mean? Like well, they, the comfort they, they, thing, they, yeah. yeah. It's the comfort thing's one of, one of the things I, um, we were thinking about because what's the difference like, between between you know wrestling in you know essentially a gear which you which you've chosen and helps to build towards your character, and then you're wrestling the clothes on. Is it is it difficult to try and create an impression that way? Um, definitely, definitely. Like I mean, I was. I was a heel, and I just I had to be extra, extra, extra dirty. You know what I mean? Because like, who's gonna boo a naked chick? That's a fair point. You know what I mean? That that's hard. <laughs> so, but I mean, like, it it sounds kind of obvious, but I I would say more than anything, I just felt really, really naked. <laughs> if that well, obviously it should make sense, but like, I don't really know any other way to describe it. Like my matches over, I was like, I won. Give me my pants. Like, it's just, <laughs> was it really well paid though? Yeah. I mean, I, there's no way that I would have just been like, all right, you know, let me let me take next to nothing for wearing nothing. Like, yeah, no, they they totally took care of us big time. And it, it lasted for what a couple of years. Did you do many shows for them? Not really. Um, we did the one big pay per view in Toronto, and then we did an appearance in L.A. at Boulevard Three, and that was actually um like a wet T-shirt wrestling type of thing. And they had the after party at the Playboy Mansion, which was really rad because I got to go there. The Playboy Mansion? Did you get to meet half? No, nobody came out. It was so lame. Oh. Like, it was like, and nobody would ever say, like, oh, I went to the Playboy Mansion. It was lame. But it kind of was because I just, I felt like I was at like a, like a Playboy Museum, you know what I mean? Because like nobody came outside. It was just weird. It was all like people from like Sunset Tan and stuff. Oh. Annie Social's life is amazing. Yeah, I think the thing that I noticed when I was watching at NWWL, because I caught, I caught a match or two, and the weird thing is, after about, like, maybe three or four minutes, I completely uh-huh. forgot that, that, um, that, that, you know, there was two naked women wrestling. It was just a case I was watching the wrestling as opposed to, uh, as opposed to anything else. I don't know if that yeah. makes me weird or what. No, and they actually, that was, that was the point, and it's, it's really cool that you felt that way about it, because that's honestly what they were going for, and that was kind of like the vision of Ron's when he was helping the girls put their matches together. Like, he stressed really hard on making sure it was good wrestling, so that people didn't just think it was a big, stupid, naked smut fest, you know what I mean? I would equate it then to Hooters, in the fact that you go there first time, you think, wow, all these, all these, all these women who are dressed in really small clothes, and then you think, I'm going to go back for the food. Yeah, so, I mean, it was cool. I'm trying to think. Uh, we also did um, it was uh, three or four shows in Milwaukee at this big like biker convention thing. It was like the Harley Davidson 105th anniversary. 
what's but other than that, I just did a few like internet matches for them. Well, what's, what's a crowd like? How would you how how's it differ to you know what would you what would you consider to be a normal wrestling crowd? Um, hmm. I don't even know. Like, I mean, obviously, most of the people were going for the draw of staring at naked chicks. You know what I mean? So it wasn't really like a wrestling fan crowd. It was more of like a crowd equate to maybe like a crowd that would go to like a strip club. You know what I mean? But they got into it. You know, they're real hype. And uh, we got a really good reaction out of all of them. Like, they actually did like feed into like the good guy and the bad guy. Like, they actually knew who to, who to cheer and who to boo. And it was it was really good. You mentioned you made you made a lot of money doing it. As far as as far as you know, maybe maybe doors or um or you know your people's perception of you in wrestling did it did it change with anybody? Did they did people think well you know obviously they think oh she's not taking it seriously because she's doing NWWL and she's not respecting wrestling or or anything like that? Did you get any backlash from it? I mean, I'm, nobody said anything to my face, but I mean, people have been judging me my entire career because I mean, right now I'm I'm still a dancer. I'm an exotic dancer in Philly, but it's like, I got bills to pay, dude, so unless you want to pay them, I'm going to keep my job. So, I mean, I always get a backlash. It doesn't matter what I do. Well, that sucks, but I guess by this point, you just don't care, right? No, I don't care. I mean, it sucks to be judged, but I mean, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it doesn't really affect my life that much, whether someone likes me or hates me. Like, it's just, it's kind of, it's stupid. Like, I don't judge people for what they do. So, whatever. That's all cool. I mean, let's let's move on then from from WWL uh, and WWL. Let's talk a little bit about um, WSU. Um, it's been around for a long time. I think a lot longer than people give it credit for. Uh, and you know, you've been around with WSU for quite a long time as well. Probably best known in there for your, uh, your tag team with Roxy Cotton. Um, as far uh-huh. as um, yeah, as far as she's concerned. Um, you know, how, how she complimented you and your act and what you do. I love Roxy. She is incredible. And we were, like, night and day. So, like, it, it totally worked out. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, it was such a weird dynamic that you, could, you couldn't help but watch what was going on, you know? And uh, I'm actually kind of sad I don't tag with her that much anymore because she's a lot of fun to work with. Do you prefer being in a tag team or uh, do you like the singles rather? Um... To be honest, like, as long as I have an awesome tag team partner, I'm cool with tagging, but I actually do prefer singles. I think I perform better in a singles match. I don't know. It's just, it's more comfortable. It's not, like, as much of a, like, a craziness, you know? It's funny you mention that, because I, cause I, I would not, 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 not primarily think of you, but if, uh, if I look at, uh, look back at some of your, uh, your sort of accomplishments in wrestling, a lot of them are in tag teams. You know, you, you were the first ever WSU tag champ with, with Roxy, and then, uh, also in WEW, you were, you were, you were tag champs there a couple of times. It just seems, and then also in Shimmer as well, you're, all, you've been, uh, you've been in a tag team with, with Melanie Cruz. It just seems like, you know, in each promotion that you seem to be, uh, have a, have a tag partner. Yeah, it's weird, right? I mean, but uh, I like working with Melanie. I think that's awesome because I just I'm fascinated by her height. Just because I'm so short, I just I think that's so rad that she's like six feet tall. I think it's incredible. So it's like a, uh, that's another like kind of cool dynamic, you know. It just may it just sort of uh, lend itself easily as far as a, 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 of a visual interpretation goes. I'll give you that. Uh, <laughs> You uh, you seem to work at a lot of different promotions. I guess you know it's um it, like you said you'll you'll go uh, where where they're willing to book you and stuff. Is there is there any case of maybe maybe clashes? Because I, I guess you know as far as like you know fans are concerned, people people try and try and make up maybe a a, a sort of a, a sort of running feud between WSU and and Shimmer, for instance. It, it doesn't sound like there is one or anything like that. But uh, I mean, is is there any case where you know somebody says, you know, I, I prefer if you you know weren't working with them, or you know we we'll, we'll look after you a bit better if you don't work with these guys? I haven't really had that problem to be honest. Like, I mean, the, the most would be like, say, if somebody wanted to book you in the same exact building that someone would be running in a week after. Like, I could see there being a problem there because. That's just, it's kind of repetitive, you know what I mean? Like, if someone's going to put you on a show, say, I don't know, say I'm having a show at my house, and I want to book Roxy Cotton. But someone else is having a show at my house the week before. Mm. I would probably not be too happy about her doing a show at my house the week before my show. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? 
but I mean, like that that's the only discrepancy there could ever possibly be. Like there's not really any weird feuds going on mm-hmm. between any wrestling feds right now. Mm-hmm. You, you were talking about uh, how you prefer wrestling singles. You were you you held uh, the uh, PWU um, singles title there. Uh, as far as far as that was concerned, is that is that one sort of your major accomplishments? I mean, it was it was very short lived, but I was I was very happy with it because I mean it was it was home to me. Like it was where I trained. I, I I actually got to win a title in a building where I was sweating and dying on the floor four days a week. So I mean that was that was pretty major for me. You said that there's no there's no there's no feud between uh, between the Shimmer and WSU or anything like that, but uh, I think it's probably fair to say that some fans imagine there are there there, there is. When you, you turned up in Shimmer, it was um, it was one of those weird things where a lot of people sort of didn't want to accept you because uh, they sort of thought that mm-hmm. you represented the opposite of what Shimmer they believe Shimmer stands for. Um, you know, do you, I, th- I think it's fair to say though, that you've won them over as far as you're concerned. You finally got in the ring at the last set of tippings. Um, does it matter to you, um, you know, as far as uh, proving yourself in, in Shimmer as a wrestler, or uh, were you happy just being a, uh, a manager? Well, I mean, I thought I thought it was really cool that that I got to wrestle there because, like you said, like nobody felt that I belonged there. So, I mean, I did I did feel a big sense of accomplishment when I got to do that. And I think it's cool that their fans are starting to accept me. You know what I mean? It goes back to that whole judgy thing I was talking about. Like, sure. you know, they want to think, like, I'm a, I'm a big dirt and I'm, like, some kind of penthouse pet or some crap. And, like, I actually got a chance to be on a platform with a lot of wrestlers that they respect. So that really did mean a lot to me. We weren't at the tapings that, that you first made your debut at. But as far as the uh, you know, fans' reaction to you, what was that like? Oh, dude, they legit hated me. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Like, there's this one kid, and he was totally at the last show, too. Like, he was just screaming the C word at me. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah. He's like, <laughs> like, I don't even know what I can say on here, but he was like, You're You can say whatever f-. you like. He's basically he's like, You're a fucking cunt. I was like, Oh, really? I'm like, You catch your mother with that mouth? That is incredible. <laughs> like, whatever. I think it's funny. Like, I, th- I think it's hilarious that I pissed that guy off. So much that it damn near ruined his time. Just by standing there, like I'm like, wow. I you know, he just awesome. showed up. Oh hell yeah, man! It was it was actually it was pretty intense. Like I I've, I've never like I actually I felt like you know I felt very powerful at that point. I'm like, wow, I can just stand here and you hate me that much. That's incredible. You must have loved that. <laughs> oh, I thought it was great. And then he came back to the show you guys were at and he's screaming like the cunt bomb at me again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, who is this man? We need to hear from you. I don't even know, man. Come on, call in. Say it again. I dare you. <laughs> During your time there, you've been associated with Wesna. Um, you know, she's had to she's had to retire recently, just you know, due to you know various injuries and the toll that wrestling's taken on her body. Is that something that you're ever concerned about? Do you sort of look long term at what damage uh, wrestling's doing to your body uh, and your future your future health or? Uh, uh, you know, do, you, do you not think about that? Is that just something else to be worried about on another day? Like, I try not to think about it, but I mean, it is a very real concern. Like you can't, like, like you just said, like what Wesna was forced to retire due to injury. Like it's, I, I always think about it, but I try not to think about it too much because when I think about things too much, then they happen. <laughs> so trying to put that on the back. Fair point. So what thoughts about Wesna as well as a performer? I mean, she's incredible as far as I can, as far as I'm concerned. She definitely is incredible, and it was it was an honor to work with her, man. It really was. I was like, whoa, really? You guys are going to put me with Wesna? That's that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so I mean, it was it was definitely cool, and she's very nice. Like she was a very very nice girl, and a pleasure to work with. You sort of got sort of interjected into the whole cheerleader Melissa Wesna feud that were that, that started off in in in, um, in chick fight, well even before chick fight, I suppose. Moved into chick fight and then moved into shimmer as well. And this was this was sort of a, a big thing that people had talked about around the world. And you were you were part of it. And you were right there. I mean that that's it, as far as as far as we were concerned, watching it, you're thinking that's pretty special. Oh, definitely, man. Like that that was an honor because uh, Melissa's one hell of a performer, man. She puts herself through hell. And it was really cool to be there ringside to see that whole thing going down and to, to actually get to work with her a bit as, as well. Um, she's just 
she's amazing, man. Like, I've never seen somebody be able to just pull off so many characters and just do it to the fullest extent. You know, like, when it was Raisha Saeed, like, for a long time, I didn't even know it was her. <laughs> like, I actually, I actually had a wiki, like, I did not know that was Melissa. Like, she did it so well and just made it a totally different entity, you know what I mean? So it was really cool to work with her. Interesting. And then, and then you, you sort of got your come up as well. Like you, you were, you, you know, you'd been winding up Melissa over the, over that sort of weekend of, of the, the bulk of the tapings, and uh, in the end, she finally got your hands on you. And uh, I think that guy who was in the crowd who hated you must have loved that moment. Oh, I bet he did. <laughs> I will bet he did. And basically, I think they're all like, "Yeah, welcome to Shimmer. How do you like that?" <laughs> so, no, that was cool though. That was really cool. Uh, one thing I detected there when you said you were, like, you know, you sort of were like, oh, really? You're putting me with Wesna? Uh, suggests to me that, you know, while you were never a wrestling fan growing up, you must watch a little bit of uh, wrestling now. Um, have you got any ambitions as far as, you know, people that are out there that you've never worked with that you'd like to get an opportunity to wrestle? I would like to work with everyone at least once. Like, I know that sounds really generic, but, I mean, you can learn something from every experience. So, I mean, there's really no one in particular, but I, I really, I would like to work with everyone at least once. Uh, so I take it from what you're telling me, then, you would like to continue to be um, in Shimmer, at least a performer, rather than just as a manager? Um. Well, I'll, I'll take it wherever it takes me. Like, I'm, I'm happy doing anything with them. They're a great group. And it's it's really really cool to be a part of uh, you know such a such a talented locker room like it's pretty intense. And what about ambitions then, as far as your uh, career in general is concerned? Would you actively be seeking a contract with um, one of the big two, or are you happy just being on the indies at the minute? I mean, I'm happy on the indies, but uh, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't turn my nose up at a contract. You know what I mean? That's that's the big stage and. I'm pretty sure everybody wouldn't mind doing that. Like I don't, I don't have a preference either way, but uh, you know, I'm happy just to be wrestling wherever I'm wrestling. Well, by the time that this uh, this makes it uh, makes it online, uh, you would have already uh, be, had had another another match in uh, Jersey All Pro because uh, you know <laughs> we we saw you we saw you in April, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that one in a second. But you also uh, you've also got a match uh, on well what will be on Saturday. But you're wrestling Sarah Del Rey for the uh, Jersey All Pro Women's title. Yes, I am. Looking forward to that. Actually, I am. Uh, Sarah's awesome, and uh, this would be the second time. I got to work with her because I did get to work with her once in PW uh, pretty early on. But uh, I feel like I'll learn a lot from it, and it'll be really good. I guess in the time between PWU and now, both of you have really sort of grown and expanded as performers and changed a lot as well. Yeah. I Somehow I, I became like tiny power move girl. I don't know how that happened. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> What were you before then? I, I used to do a lot of cute flippy stuff, <laughs> and I don't know what happened to all that. Like now, I'm just I'm I'm kind of like a big striker. I think it's from working with Devin Moore so much. I started headbutting people and liking it. <laughs> <laughs> Scrappy might be the way we describe you. Yeah, there you go. Scraptastic. There you go. There's a nickname for you. <laughs> so now now this is going to be, this show's going to be called with the Scraptastic Annie Social. Nice. You wrestled. We were talking about in April. We saw you. Uh, we saw you wrestle at uh, Jersey All Pro back in April as well. You wrestled uh, Mizaki Ohata. Um, they, when they sort of they sort of trip over here, they wrestled at they wrestled at Shimmer and they also wrestled at, uh, at Jersey All Pro. We weren't expecting you to be involved in that match. We we thought there was going to be a tag match. We didn't know you were even going to be there. Well, guess what? I wasn't expecting me to be involved in that either. That kind of got thrown into my lap. <laughs> but, I mean, it was, it was really cool. I was like, wow, seriously, you're going to let me wrestle one of these awesome Japanese chicks? I'm totally down with that. Let's do it. <laughs> How did you find that as far as language barrier was concerned? Um, it, You know what? It really wasn't that bad. Um, I just I kind of have a weird knack for uh, communicating with people that speak very little English. I, I don't understand it. I don't know how I do it, but I somehow pull it off. Wow. Yeah, I work with a lot of, uh, like, for NWE, like, that's actually an Italian-based company, yeah. and a lot of the higher-ups, like, they, they speak mainly Italian, very little English. So, I mean, I, I communicate with them a lot, and I'm actually, I'm used to talking to people that speak different languages. Like, we have some guys from Mexico. We've had, uh, we have one guy from France. Like, I'm just used to speaking to people that don't really speak English a lot. So, 
It was actually pretty easy. Must be a bit of a difference, though, compared to uh, compared to speaking with somebody who, like you say, who speaks Spanish or speaks Italian or speaks French, because at least you're dealing with pretty much the same the same alphabet there, and uh, you know, they, they, you, there might be the odd word that you can pick up from time to time. But but you know, I listen to Japanese. I'm thinking I can't pick out a single word of that. Um. Well, she was she she spoke a little English. Yeah. Uh, Misaki. So um, it was it was pretty easy. She did have a translator like on hand, and I maybe had to ask him like one question. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, wrest- wrestling is pretty much its own language, so it really wasn't that hard to get it together. It's a lot of feel based stuff, and you just sort of went went with what sort of felt right and what worked, and um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, as far as um, we, we we talked about a, a bit about uh, you know, a dangerous women wrestling, and uh, you know, going going back to the. Uh, Back to the arena. So you mentioned it's like a a bit of a homecoming for you. Um, yeah. As far as you know, going back to that, is it? Um, what, what's your thoughts about it? Is it the case of you know, God? I, I, I'm surprised it's been this long. I, I you know I just I wish uh, I kind of wish it hasn't been this long since uh, since being back. I mean, it's it's definitely been too long since I've been home. But I'm honestly I'm kind of happy about it because like I've had a lot more experience in the past three years, so I feel like I can give them a way better show because it's kind of strange, but I am notoriously hated in my own ho- hometown. <laughs> like, Philly is a very tough crowd. Well, it's like, always had that reputation, have, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to damn near kill yourself for people like you here. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hopefully, I'm ready to give it to them. You, you're wrestling but, somebody, uh, uh, the person uh, who, I've, who I've not heard of, uh, Mia Yim. Uh, um, you, uh, I, I don't know much about her. She is incredible. She really is. Um, she, she's damn near brand new. Great girl, a lot of fun to work with. Um, she's actually she's based in Virginia, and uh, I'm not sure who trained her, but she's she's definitely she's she's going to be something to watch out for. Like definitely remember her name because she's she's doing it. She's wrestled on Jersey All Pro, is that right as well? Um, I worked with her a few times. I actually had a I had one singles match with her, and uh, we did a six man intergender tag. It was me and the Osirian Portal against her and the Southside Players Club. God, I love all but those I, people involved. Uh, yeah, with the stages and everything, it's crazy. They yeah, had a crazy it, it, it was quite an experience uh, seeing the, the, uh, the seeing the Players Club live because that that, yeah. that entrance we were talking about it, and Stu sitting there going, "This is incredible." I'm just waiting for somebody to just bust their ass on that champagne on the floor. Like, I know. And it'll probably be me. Like, I'll slip off and crack my skull on the floor in Rahway. But, yeah, I, it's bound to happen. But it is cool. Definitely cool to look at. This is why you insist of- on wrestling before they come out. Is that right? Yeah, man. <laughs> Well, we're looking at uh, the sort of lineup for um, for dangerous women wrestling, and Stu mentioned the uh, the, the tagline before of uh, hot women wrestlers, midgets, cripples, dancers, and more. I can't not say it again. It's brilliant. But <laughs> you've got it's a real sort of mixed bag of um, of, of of wrestling going on there. You, I'm just looking at the looking at some of the details here. You have got the return of GI Ho, who you talked about before, uh, who you, you wrestled. Was that your, your first oil match as well? It sure was, man. She's a tough girl. It's like everything's coming full circle. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So it's, I never, like, I never expected her to come back. Like I, I was told, like you know, she was like retired, done doing anything. Like maybe join the police academy, possibly a bunch of other crap. Like I don't even know, but that's crazy that they got her on the show. This is a real sort of, it, I guess, it, you know, they, they equate wrestling shows quite a long time to you know to a circus and the fact that if you don't like one thing, you're going to like something else. And if you don't like that, you're probably going to like the next thing that comes on. And this is, this is probably. The, uh, the the sort of poster child for that. There's, there's so much stuff going on there. You're bound to like something on there, I guess. Yeah, definitely. We definitely have something for everybody. Actually, a lot of people I work with coming too, so it's pretty cool to see a lot of my friends because a lot of them have never been to a show, so it'll be kind of neat. Yeah, so to see yeah. how they react to it. All right. Well, so if we sort of, sort of throw it out there and say, here you go, you could do you could do uh, do a, sort of a big sell for uh, for this pay per view on uh, on May twenty seventh. What would you say? Well, how would you encourage people to maybe come along or afterwards buy the pay per view? Well, we're gonna have some boobs and some blood and some just pure unadulterated craziness. So I suggest you check it out because you will be missing something awesome if you don't check boobs it out. Boobs and blood. Boobs and blood and all round craziness. That's a great set. That, that, that's almost as good as hot women, wrestlers, midgets, cripples, dancers, and more. Uh, well, that was the more. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, 
one thing they sort of um, they wanted to ask you just near the end, and because uh, I was doing a little bit of a little bit of searching around for you, and I saw that your uh, your Amazon wish list, which is <laughs> one of one of the strangest things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, you guys don't know me that well yet. I, I I've done stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, okay, uh, the, the strangest thing for now is uh, that we saw what this um, the list of some of the things which you have to now there's sorts of things on there that I would I'd expect to be there. You know, you got you got your brass knuckles, you got brass knuckle mugs, which I think are fantastic. I'm going to buy myself a couple of those, and then also a whole bunch of Tom Hanks movies. Hell yeah, dude! Tom Hanks rules. He's like one of the best actors ever. How can you not like Tom Hanks? Oh no, no, I'm not got a problem with Tom Hanks in any way. I just thought it's quite a bit. I, I wasn't expecting. Uh, to, to see that on there, I was expecting maybe something like Bad Lieutenant or something like that. I love him, man. He's so cool. I got I actually have to I have to take two of the movies off because I just got the Terminal and uh, Cast Away. But he's he's been in a lot of my favorite movies. What what is your favorite? Just out of curiosity. God, I have so many favorites. Please say Big. Big is awesome. <laughs> I'm definitely like Big. But you know what? Um, one of my favorite Tom Hanks movies is probably The Burbs. Ah. Yeah, that's a throwback, right? <laughs> it's a good one though. Like, it just reminds me of, like, uh, like I was talking about my neighborhood earlier. Like, there's always something crazy going on to watch. So I think that's why that I kind of identify with that movie, because I could legit go outside right now and sit on my front steps and just watch all kinds of interesting shit. You should blog it. That'd be amazing. I should. You know what? <laughs> What's funny is uh, me and my roommate were thinking about doing a podcast called The Stoop, where we just kind of sit on the front stoop and just talk about random shit. And maybe have a guest and just don't even pay attention to them. Just talk about back in the day stuff. <laughs> and, and whatever you're seeing going on, names have been changed to protect the criminals, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it from the Mouth of Annie Social herself. Boobs and blood coming up at Dangerous Women to Wrestling. Apart from that, Jersey All Pro Wrestling this uh, Saturday night. Uh, if you want to check that out, uh, it's going to be Sarah Del Rey versus Annie Social for the Jersey All Pro Women's Championship.